again, open our hearts and minds, our spirits to what the God, what the Spirit of God wants to say. So, God, thank you that you are a God that is not far off, that you're not standoffish, that you never turn your back on us, that no matter how distant we may feel, no matter how many times we turn our back on you, that you are a God that is always facing forward us, always facing um, our direction, looking at us and present with us. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would do a mighty work in our lives today. And again, I don't know what all the needs in this room are for your grace and mercy, but I know that you are a God that is near to those needs. And so may we be a church that approaches your throne with confidence because you are a good God and you are a loving God and you are a faithful God. And no matter how distant we might feel in proximity to you, you are never distant from us and you're always ready to respond. So increase our faith, increase our expectation that your Holy Spirit is going to do something mighty in our lives today as we gather together. Because where your church gathers, we know that your spirit just wants to come and infuse your presence. Thank you for the resources that will be given this morning. We pray that you would find faithful hands to use them as we continue to submit to the work of your mission in our community. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. So good to be with you in late August, uh, last Sunday of August, as Abigail said, if you're a student and you are returning, welcome back. So good to see some of you trickling in. Teachers, how'd it go for you this week? Many of you had your first weeks back? Yeah, you're almost there, huh? Um, only like 42 left to go or something like that, but right around the corner, I don't know how many weeks left you have. But parents, how did you do this week? Was this like sadness or freedom? Um, freedom and ecstasy uh, for our parents in the room who are like, they're back at school. Well, speaking of parents, I ran across an interesting article. Um, maybe you, you saw this, but I was reading the AP. It's an AP article that talked, and I'll, I'll just read the, uh, the headline to you because I, I had to click on this one. It said, South Dakota woman recently gave birth to triplets. This was like two weeks ago. She says she didn't find out about her pregnancy until she went to the hospital, okay, with what she thought were kidney stones. <laughs> Can you imagine being that ER doctor who has to come into the room and say, they're not kidney stones, you are going to pass something, <laughs> um, or someone's, and not one or two, but three. Uh, how does that, I don't know. Um, she gave birth to healthy triplets on August 10th. Um, she says that despite having two other children, so I guess this was children three, four, and five, she did not know she was 34 weeks pregnant. She said when she started having pain, she thought it was from kidney stones, which she's had before. And doctors told her, no, you're actually in labor with multiple babies. They were born four minutes apart, each weighed around four pounds. Here's a picture of them. Can you see that? Uh, you can't really see that, can you? Now you can, see, now you can see it slightly better, yes? There they are. Oh, they're, and their names. This is great. Their names, Blaze, Gypsy, and Nikki. So there they are. Blaze, Gypsy. I, I don't want to judge, but I think Nikki kind of got shorthanded there. Um, Blaze and Gypsy, and then like Nicole. Um, come on now. So there they are. I thought that was fascinating. All right, moving on. Um, We've spent a good portion of our summer meandering, as it were, through the book of Proverbs, as you see behind me in our summer series entitled Wisdom and the Art of Living. And I hope that as we've kind of gone through uh, the book of Proverbs, that we've been garnering all sorts of wisdom. And today, I want to kind of start, as they would say, I want to kind of start our initial descent today. We're going to kind of land this plane, this summer series, um, eventually here. Um, but I want to spend some time, before we do, in the last chapter of Proverbs. And so if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Proverbs 31. And this morning I've asked uh, two moms in the room to read our scripture. And so Gabby Ibarra and her mom are going to come up for us this morning. Give them a round of applause. This is Gabby and Berta. And... 
and, and they are going to read for us in English and in Spanish today. And so, Abigail, I don't know if you have your mic. Where that? Or can I use this one maybe? Is this one okay? Uh, I don't know if we, we can we can share back to back. So first, perhaps first in English. Uh, so, uh, Gabby, if you'll read first for us, and then her mom will read. Berta will read in Spanish for us. mother's daughter. Listen, my son. Listen, son of my womb. Listen, my son. The answer to my prayers. Do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin your kings. It's not for kings, Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer. Let they dream and forget what has been between the decreed and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Let beer be for those who are perishing, wine for those who are in anguish. Let them dream, forget their poverty, and remember their misery no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Destituted. <laughs> Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Que el Señor bendiga la iglesia. Vamos a leer la palabra del Señor que dice Proverbios 31, del 1 al 9. Dichos del Rey Lemuel. Los dichos del rey Lemuel, oráculo mediante el cual su madre lo instruyó. ¿Qué pasa, hijo mío? ¿Qué pasa, hijo de mis entrañas? ¿Qué pasa, fruto de mis votos al Señor? No gastes tu vigor en las mujeres, ni tu fuerza en las que arruinan a los reyes. No conviene que los reyes, oh Lemuel, no conviene que los reyes beben al vino ni que los gobernantes se entreguen al licor. No sea que al beber se olviden de lo que la ley ordena y, y priven de sus derechos a todos los oprimidos. Dale licor a los que están por morir y vino a los amargados. Que beban y se olviden de su pobreza, que no vuelvan a acordarse de sus penas. Levanta la voz por los que no tienen voz Defiende los derechos de los desposeídos. Levanta la voz y hazme justicia. Defiende los pobres y necesitados. Amén. Amén. Thank you so much. Yeah, you can clap for that. Last Sunday we were singing in Spanish. If you were here last Sunday, we had some guest worship leaders to lead out in Pomona. We were singing and worshiping in Spanish. And I thought, today we need to hear the word of God read in Spanish. And so, thank you both of you. For reading our scripture. I apologize, I got the chapter wrong. That's to, that's not them, that's totally me. It's Proverbs 31, not 30. So if you're like, well, we think we're off one chapter, that's on me, not them. Um, but what they just read is a section of Proverbs that is traditionally known, and you heard it in English um, from Gabby, as the sayings of King Lemuel, which from the very onset, there are a couple of problems right from the beginning, when, when, when we uh, read just kind of the title, the sayings of King Lemuel, an inspired utterance, uh, his mother taught uh, him. A couple of problems. Uh, problem number one, no biblical record of any king of Israel named Lemuel. And so right away, you're like, who is this king? Because if you're, some of you are like, I never heard of that king. I remember I've, you, a lot of you have read First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings and perhaps First and Second Chronicles, which talk all about the kings of Israel. And maybe some of you are wondering, I don't remember a Lemuel in that list of kings, and you would be right. There is no such king. That makes us wonder, oh, what's the deal with this king thing? Is he a king? Like I mentioned last week, this could perhaps be a Gentile king, a king of some other land, or it could have been just somebody who thought he was a king, perhaps. Uh, that's how he referred to himself. We see that in today's culture, even uh, down the road at our beloved Lakers with our LeBron James, who refers to himself as the what? 
King James. So I guess it could be a little bit like that. He could have been really good at sports. So whatever sport Lemuel played, he referred to himself as King Lemuel. We don't know. But the first problem with this text is we have no biblical record of any king, at least in Israel, named Lemuel. And some of you saw the second problem as well right from the beginning. To call this these his sayings or his wisdom is a complete misnomer, is it not? Because actually, we learn from the very first verse that's bolded up there that these sayings or this wisdom, whatever we're going to read in this small section of Proverbs 31, uh, it was given to him from his mother. So can we be fair this morning and just give credit to where credit is due? Uh, Because what we have here and what we just heard is not some guy named Lemuel who might be a king. It's not his wisdom, is it? This is the wisdom that he has been given from his mother. So if you notice in your bulletin, this sermon title today, I entitled this sermon, The Sayings of King Lemuel's Mom, or Mother, because we're giving credit to where credit is due. And I don't know about you, but that's kind of uh, reassuring to me, because moms just give the best wisdom, don't they? Come on now, let's be honest. Um, When our kids come to me for advice, one of my typical responses, I'll give an answer, but then I'll typically say what? What did your mom say? <laughs> Have you checked with your mother? And if she says something different than I just said, well, let's just go with her. Because what I have found is the majority of the time, that is the better option. Dad's in the room. Can I get an amen? You're like, I sometimes don't know what to say or know what to do. I'm like, what did your mom say? Moms give the best advice. Here's one of my, uh, most of the time, but I want to show you a quick clip. Because here's one of my favorite comedians talking about wisdom from moms that is sometimes not helpful. Tim Hawkins. Uh, I like to try to give them good advice, you know, and try, I'm trying, doing the best I can. But sometimes parents will just fail at advice. I remember my mom when I was a kid. She used to give me good advice too late. <laughs> Think about it, good advice too late. Like when I was a kid, I hit my head on the corner of the table. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> I'm sure glad you were there, Hoss. <laughs> Who knows what would have happened, Nostradamus? <laughs> Moms are a big help when you lose something, aren't they? <laughs> you lose something? Your mom is just not a help at all. Hey, Mom, I can't find my wallet. Well, it's got to be somewhere. <laughs> That's good. I thought I was going crazy for a minute. I thought I was looking for something that didn't exist. Thank you. And then they go, where'd you leave it last? You're good. Thanks, Captain Obvious. I was on a totally different track. I was looking where I left it. How many of you can relate? Uh, you're like, that is a, a window into my childhood. <laughs> or it, that happened today. <laughs> oh, and the sun is right in front of her. <laughs> son of my womb. <laughs> so good, so good, so good. Um, mom and in advice and wisdom, they are usually the best <laughs> most of the time. And what we're, we just heard today is wisdom from a mom. And, and she is unnamed, uh, never named. She's always just known as Lemuel's mom or his mother. We never know her name. Um, but she is going to give some advice to her son, who is some sort of king, at least in his own mind. And now, if you've been around this summer, this should come as no surprise to you. Because all summer long, as we've been reading through the book of Proverbs, we've seen throughout that wisdom in the Bible is personified as a woman, a mom, perhaps. A, a, a woman, that's the way we see from beginning to end. Wisdom is personified as a woman. Uh, there's a whole chapter, I believe it's Proverbs chapter 8, that's all about lady wisdom. And so she has been our guide throughout the summer. This started in Proverbs 1. In Proverbs 1, you read about a dad who's giving advice to his son, and he's basically saying, pay attention to your mom. Pay attention to lady wisdom. Pay attention because she will save you. She will help you. She will guide you. And is it not interesting that here we are at the last chapter of Proverbs, and we don't have a father giving advice to his son. We have a mother giving advice to her son. 
and telling him about the same. Pay attention, she says. And now as she launches into her wisdom, if we go back to Proverbs 31, verse 2, you'll see. As she launches into her wisdom, the first thing that catches my attention is that she has to try and get the attention of her grown son no less than three times. Can anybody relate? Three times, not once, but three times she has to say to her grown son, listen, listen, son, listen, or que pasa, I love that in Spanish, didn't you? Que pasa, hijo, que pasa, hijo. Three times she's trying to get the attention of this grown man. It, 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 it doesn't go away no matter how old they are, right, moms? Um, why don't you listen to me? And so she tries three times to get his attention. And the call once again, lest we miss it, the call once again is for us to pay attention. It's for us to listen. It's for us to be attentive. It's like something is coming. Wisdom is coming. You better catch this. This is going to help you. This is going to save you. Consider this. Become aware of whatever I'm going to say. And after getting his attention the third time, after getting his attention, she launches into two successive, really, I guess what you would call them as warnings, aren't they? There's like two warnings, like two what not to do's, and then a couple to do's. There's both a not to do list and a to do list in this uh, section. And it's really, she cites two potential problems, I would say, for any leader. Two potential problems for any king, any leader. Let's make it even, we'll go even further. Any person who exercises any measure of power over anyone else. Anybody who has any influence over anyone. She says, I, I want to give you a, a warning for anybody who has perhaps privilege and exercise it. And the two potential problems uh, seem to, at least for her son, they revolve around women and wine, don't they? I mean, that's for her and her son. She's warning him, him about the potential problems of unhealthy attachments to people and unhealthy attachments to certain products. And she kind of elaborates on that. One would actually wonder if she has in mind perhaps another king who lived around the same time that these sayings were being collected. Uh, perhaps she has in mind a, 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 a king of Israel who, uh, when she warns her son uh, to, if you look in verse 3, don't spend your strength. That word in Hebrew, strength, can also be translated wealth. Don't spend your wealth. Don't spend your strength, she says, on women. Your vigor on those who ruin kings. Perhaps she's seen it happen, yeah? Perhaps she's watched the downfall of another king, a biblical king, who spent his, certainly spent his strength and spent his wealth on women. And so it's almost like she's giving him advice. And, and oh, by the way, that king, the, like, the majority of the Proverbs that we have read has been attributed to that king, right? Solomon, third king of Israel, son of David, who uh, if you read 1 Kings chapter 11, it says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites, skip down to verse 3. He had 700 wives of royal birth, 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. One would argue that Solomon certainly spent a bit of strength and wealth on women. If you consider 700 wives and 300 concubines excessive. Yeah. So I wonder, I just happen to wonder if Lemuel's mom, as she's giving advice to her king about eh, what could be your ruin, what could be your downfall. We've seen this happen before. The wives, 1 Kings 11 said, led him astray. And as history would play itself out, this would eventually be the demise of Solomon, would it not? This would not only be the demise of Solomon, this would be the demise of Israel. This would be demi the demise of the United Kingdom of Israel. It would, that, uh, after Solomon, the kingdom would divide. After Solomon, the kingdom would not only divide, it would go to other kings who led uh, the, the nations both north and south further and further astray, right into Assyria for the ten tribes of the north. Uh, 150 years later, right into Babylon for the two tribes of the south. This has gotten them nowhere. Fa so when she gives this wisdom to her son about not spending your strength, on unhealthy attachments to women. Perhaps she's speaking from some experience. Now, the other warning, if you read on to verse 4, the other warning is about this unhealthy craving for alcohol. She says, it's not for kings, Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine. It's not for rulers to crave beer, she says. And I'm saying this to the vineyard, whose very name is the source, right? 
it's like I'm saying this to the baby, when she says, uh, you know what, it's not for kings to drink wine. No, 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 not for rulers to crave beer. And fear not, lest some of you think I'm about to ruin your Labor Day barbecue next weekend. You're like, oh boy, so here we go, you know, completely. Th- th- this is not necessarily, if you read the scholarship around this, she's not advocating for abolition. She, wh- what she seems to be talking about here is suggest, you know, don't, when you're drinking to the point of drunkenness, when you're drinking excessively, when you have an unhealthy attachment to alcohol, it is going to affect and impair your ability to make good and wise decisions. And we know that, right? We see that. And that seems to be the spirit of what she's talking about. But, you know, pastors like us, we, we measure success and we measure the impact that we are making. I, mean, I guess different pastors measure success and measure impact differently. And, uh, and, and for us, perhaps, it's, no, it's, it's the same. Um, I don't know. But uh, earlier this summer, I got a, I got a, I got a window into my, and I would say our collective impact and our success. I got a window into that this summer when I got a call. Um, I got a call from somebody in this church, uh, called me on a, on a weekday, and that, that person actually happens to be in the room uh, today. Uh, but, but I got a call from someone in the church, and last week I told you that we've moved out of our home and we've moved into this apartment for the summer. And, and while the apartment has been an amazing gift and it's been wonderful because it's given, uh, it affords me many opportunities to stop local crime that's happening at the local park. And I told that story last week about phoning and vandalism and it's given me the opportunity to do that. I, I will say that this new apartment gets terrible reception if you have AT&T as your cell service. Isn't that the worst? When you're living somewhere and you can't even make, we can't even, like, I have to go running down the sidewalk most days to, like, going like this to try to make a phone call or to try to get service. And so uh, we were in the apartment and a phone call came in and I did the dread where I, like, the phone call will come in and I pick it up and I'm like, hello? And then I hear on the other line, like, nothing. You know, I'm like, hello. And then, like, I can hear them, but they can't hear me. And then it's like they, the connection, there's something bad with the connection. So this person's calling. I can see it on the caller ID. I say hello. I'm not avoiding their call. Uh, I'm not sending it to voicemail. I'm picking up, and, and yet I can't connect. And so I, I just text them uh, because I, we do have Wi-Fi, and so I can send them a text. And so I send them a text that just says, have a bad connection, to which they replied very quickly, okay, no worries, I'll try someone else. About 30 seconds later, Abigail's phone rings, and she happens to be in the room. So they're trying one of the other pastors, you know, in the church, same person calling Abigail, but Abigail and I share the same cell service and the same cell plan. So her phone equally does not work in our apartment. And so she's having a hard time connecting with this person as well. And she's like, yeah, this person's trying to get a hold of us, I guess, which causes us to wonder what's going on, right? In the absence of information, one can only, that only leads to speculation, right? And so we're like, what is going on? And, and so we're like, maybe this person is in crisis. I don't know. They're trying to get a hold of one. They can't get a hold. They're trying to somebody else. They're like, well, okay. So I text back to this person, do you need something? And, and then I hear nothing back. And that's just the worst, isn't it? When you text someone and then like you just kind of wait to see that bubbly thing that they're sending you a text back, but it's no bubbly thing coming back if you have an iPhone, I guess, that iMessage thing. Nothing's coming back. And, and so we're kind of looking at each other. I'm like, I wonder what is going on. I mean, are they in trouble? And we're, we're, your, your mind starts then playing, you know, kind of running with you. And, and so we're both wondering about this particular person and if they're okay. And, and, and should we just call, you know what, let's just stop and pray right now for this person and, and ask God, whatever's going on in their life, they obviously need something to bless them, wherever that is going on. And sh- we know where, the, can we just drive over there and check on them? Like, what's going on? And your, your mind just starts to go places and because they're not getting back. And about, a, I don't know, about an hour or so later, they text me back. And I'm actually reading the text here. They finally respond that they got a hold of someone else, because that's what they said they would do. And the text just reads, all good, thanks, though. And so now I'm like, well, how am I to interpret that? <laughs> like, how do, what kind of thanks is that? Is that like a kind of a passive-aggressive thanks? Like, you were no help, thanks, though. We tried you. I guess it's going to work out. It's all good now. Thanks, though. And and so, like, I don't know. The day goes on, and I can't let this go. Like, I have got to find out what was going on in this person's life that they were trying to get a hold of not one but two of us. And then they're like, and then apparently, in in my mind, they, you know, so it's like, I feel like a bit of a pastoral failure 
because someone tried to call us and we weren't available and, and I wasn't there for them, which apparently somebody else was there for them in their moment when they needed them most. And, and then they say that they're all good and they're thanking me, though their thanks seems a little bit passive aggressive in the text. And so I'm so I just can't let this go. So I finally I text back to them. I text this person back. Inquiring minds want to know what's going on. Like, what is it that somebody else was able to solve your problem that, that the pastors couldn't? And, like, a few minutes go by, and I have permission from this person to read the text we got back. Their reply, okay, here it is. There's a place on Lone Hill called Lone Hill Liquor in Glendora. You see what I mean? <laughs> they were in crisis. I'm like, this person's in a crisis. They are at Lone Hill Liquor calling us. Good for them. There's a place called Lone Hill Liquor in Glendora that secretly sells a really high-rated and sought-after beer at $8 a bottle. They're getting a new shipment today, but I can't get out there. <laughs> you just have to know they have it, and they only sell one bottle at a time because it's rated top 100 beers on Beer Advocate and other websites. I was simply calling to ask you and Abigail if you could go pick me up one. <laughs> it's for a friend's birthday. I spent three hours worrying and like praying for this person who wanted me to buy them booze. <laughs> to which I texted back, totally what I was expecting you to say. <laughs> and then a few minutes later, as I reflected, I texted them this. This is my final text in this interaction with this person. I text, you know your ministry is a success when congregants are calling you asking to pick up rare beer for them in a, from, for uh, undisclosed friends from a local liquor store. You know you have arrived. <laughs> so I don't know how. Let me just say, if you're new here, that has never happened to us before. <laughs> that never happens. It has never happened before that any one of you has ever called us to buy rare beer at some liquor store because you can't make it there. But you know what? I'm glad you feel so safe and cared for. I am, I'm glad you feel safe. I'm glad you feel cared for. What I should have texted that person back is, uh, it's, it's, it's not for rulers to crave beer. Um, <laughs> that should have been my text back. Um, or, let beer be for those who are perishing. Um, that should have been my text back. Well, the point, lest we miss the point, I think the point of Lemuel's mom's advice to him seems to be that there are things in our lives that can serve as intoxicants, right? There are people that can serve as intoxicants. There are certain products that will prevent this son, this leader, this person of influence, this king, for whatever, you, whatever that means, from being able to make wise decisions. And we know that to be true. And then after a couple of like what nots to do, after a couple of carefuls, she's, she ends with the reason why. She ends with what he should focus on, what kind of leader he should be, what kind of power he should, how he should use his power. What does a wise ruler, leader, person of influence, person of power do, she says? If you go to verse 8, she says they should make decisions, they should live in such a way and make decisions that always protect the poor and the most vulnerable in any society. If you have influence, if you have even political influence, perhaps, she says, I don't know if, if he is a king, then enact decrees, enact policies, enact laws, fight for laws, executive orders that defend the oppressed, she would say. This is wise and godly living. She would say privilege and power on, and, and let me say this, privilege and power on any level. Because I know sometimes we, we detach a little bit, because, oh, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a leader, I'm not a king, I'm not... I don't, I don't make laws and stuff. I think what she would say to us is privilege and power on any level should always be used to fight and to protect those on the underside of privilege and power. This is where mom lands with her wisdom to her son. This is what he should do, she says. This is what Lady Wisdom says, which then means, if you've been following us along this series, that then means... This is what's woven into the very fabric of creation. This is what, this strikes at the heart of God, does it not? 
This, this is what it, it looks like. This reflects the heart of God. This is what it looks like to live along the grain of the universe, as we've been saying. Now, Proverbs actually is filled with ad- admonitions that deal with how we should treat the poor and needy and how we should interact with them. You can find them all over. I just picked out a few. Proverbs fourteen twenty one. It's a sin to despise one's neighbor, but blessed is the one who is kind to the needy. Proverbs nineteen seventeen. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will receive uh, from the. Uh, and he will reward them from what they have done. Proverbs twenty one thirteen. Whoever shuts their ears off, uh, shuts their ears to the cry of the poor, will also cry out and not be answered. In Proverbs twenty two nine. The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. Over and over again, Proverbs has already spoken of this. And she says, Lemuel, as a leader, as a person with power and privilege. You should be the epitome of compassion and justice. Your life should be just that. That's what Lady Wisdom would speak to you. And so she says, speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Literally, those who have been silenced in the Hebrew, that reads, literally, those who have been silenced by oppression. Speak for them, she says. For the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up, she says. Judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. If you were to go to our website and you were to click on a little link on the top of our webpage, it says our values. It would tell you a little bit about what we are about. And as uh, has been said here even today, I think, and has been said often, we're a part of a, an association of churches, of vineyard churches, um, of which there are hundreds and thousands uh, of those churches. And, and if you were to go to their website, we share the same values. And if you were to go to value number five, I want to show you that real quickly. Value number five on our website would say this. We are a people of the kingdom of God who engage in compassionate ministry. And then if you were to read about that from our association website, you would find this paragraph, which says, We lean toward the lost, the poor, the outcast, and the outsider with the compassion of Jesus as sinners whose only standing before God is utterly dependent on the mercy of God. This mercy can only be truly received in as much as we are willing to give it away. Where did we, the vineyard, get such wisdom? Might we have picked this up from someone's mom? Might we have garnered this wisdom fr- from Lady Wisdom herself? And so we, m- we use the measure, and th- the measure uh, of the power and the privilege that each one of us has individually and that we share collectively as a community, as a church, to protect and to fight for those who are silenced. That's one of our values. It's one of our core values values it goes on to read if you read a little if you if you you can stick with the website a little bit it goes on and there's one more paragraph that says this we believe that ministry in jesus's name should be expressed in concrete ways through the local church the poor are to be served as as though serving jesus himself this is one of the distinguishing characteristics of a church expressing the love of christ in a local community and if you hang around here for any time you know we are all about concrete aren't we we are we, we are hopefully very little about the subjective, about good ideas, about, well, the Bible says we should be doing things like that. We are all about what are the concrete ways that we can express the love of Jesus through the local church. And, and we do this in a, in a variety of different ways. I mean, I just listed a few. We, we, we will, and we have, and we will continue to, to partner with the local Department of Children and Family Services. That is a way that our church ex- engages in, in, in compassionate ministry. That's one of our primary ways that we've done this for the last few years. It's one of the ways we express the love of Christ locally as we serve a local government institution and as we partner with them. And we've seen doors spring wide open, and so many of you have been a part of that that ministry. Uh, we continue to be involved on a regular b- monthly basis. Alex and, and our youth meet over at Lario Park in, in the Az- Azusa Irwindale area and, and serve those who are experiencing homelessness and we serve lunch. And so we will continue to engage our community, our local community with the love of Jesus in ways like that. And then this summer we, had, we did a brand new concrete way. Uh, 33 of us, we went down south of the border, just south of Ensenada, and we, and, and, and we got to meet a, a family that we were connected to through an organization uh, called Baja Bound. And many of you, like I said, were able to go with us, and you were able to meet the Ramos family, and you were blessed from meeting them. The, just to give you a little bit of, of their history very quickly, the Ramos family was, is, a, is a family who migrated from Oaxaca 
uh, Mixteca is kind of their culture. If you know anything about those uh, indigenous peoples who are often mistreated even uh, in their, within their own country and, and, and discriminated against. We actually saw discrimination firsthand and some of our uh, guys who were down there and, and were with uh, one of the family members can attest to that where they saw firsthand and were able to speak up for somebody who was being oppressed in, in her own uh, country. Uh, we listened, they work the local fields. Uh, they make about $11, I believe it's $7 a day working the local fields, picking the produce that many of us eat uh, on our tables. And that's what they do to make a living. Um, they were able to save up enough money to buy a plot of land and we were able to build them a home in three days. As we listened, as we went and we got to hear their story, uh, like I said, we heard uh, of oppression, the oppression, the social oppression uh, that they face, the economic oppression that they have faced, cultural oppression that they have faced. Like I said, we got to even witness some of the discrimination that they faced firsthand. And, and our heart, and you have to know, our heart as a church all along wasn't just to go and in three days do something really good so that we can kind of feel better about ourselves and check that off our list. Oh, we're involved in compassionate ministry, check, and just to be gone. Our heart was to, to, to build a relationship with a family, for there to be given, there to be taken. So that's what we have done. And a few weeks ago, um, we sent another team. And that's kind of what has happened, because after returning in June, John Van Lahr contacted me, and this time he must have got me somewhere else because my phone actually worked, I think. And he contacted me, and he said, hey, can we, uh, can we just get together and talk about that trip? I, I just have some ideas. And, and we sat poolside uh, one weekday, and he just kind of shared his heart. And I said, John, I think you would be great um, as kind of heading this up. And so I, uh, I officially uh, pr I said, John, you're going to be our Vineyard Church Glendora Baja Bound Liaison. And so John was like, I would love to do that. And so... He is officially kind of taken this on, and right away, he, he put together another group. And so I want to spend our last few minutes hearing from them. And so John's going to come up, and I believe Brian as well is going to share a little bit. Uh, they recently went back, and they're going to share about that return trip and the concrete ways that we are committed to continuing to put Lemuel's mom's advice, wisdom, into practice through the local church. So come on up. Let me grab a couple mics. Oh, we got one here. Um, Y'all come. Everybody come up. Whoever went. There was about six of you, right? And we've been saying for weeks they're going to share about their experience. And uh, here we go. So I don't know who wants to start. Well, I've got some photos I will put up behind you as you kind of share. So Jacob uh, gave us about ten minutes here, but he put us at the end. So if if yeah. we go, hey, little if trick, we go John, a little longer than just, 10 minutes. Just say I'm about done, which means nothing, <laughs> uh, but it'll keep them in their seat a little bit longer. I know we have the auditorium until 1230, so. We got an hour and four <laughs> minutes. The stage. The, the well, uh, I don't know where to start. We got some pictures up Here. there. I'll, I'll, I'll hit the lights, and I'll kind of yeah. put some photos okay. up. Okay. So um, I, I want some others to to participate, uh, some of the others here, to talk about some of these things. But this is. Uh, you see, in the very front is, and in the red dress is Catalina, and to her right is Saudi, uh, her daughter. And Saudi's in somewhere in her 20s, I would say, and that is her daughter. Uh, just behind her, Brian is holding her daughter. That is Esperanza, which means hope. Mm, good name. <laughs> so really cool, right? Yeah, great connection there. And of course, our team, uh, myself and Eric Stone. Brian and Ashley and Philip. And um, so we just, I, I want to say right up front, we had a blast. <laughs> if you, if this looks attractive to you to, to go down on a mission like this, we had a lot of fun. Uh, yes, there is absolute seriousness in everything that we were doing, really, really trying to reach out and minister to this family. But we, we had a lot of fun together. And, and what I saw was God was with us that whole time. He was moving and opening doors in front of us that we really, um, you know, you know, it's nice to have an agenda when you go on these things, but, you know, you might as well throw it out sometimes. And it's that's kind Mexico. Of, right? It's there Mexico. There is no agenda. There is no agenda. It stays on track. Right? Yeah. It's, it's manana. And sometimes manana means we'll be back manana. It means we'll be back tomorrow. And that's what we did. We, we kind of had a plan to go down there for the day. Um, just uh, spend all our energy on one day 
and, and then head back through the Valle de Guadalupe and stay in our hotel and then head for the border. Um, but, you know, um, that trip energized us. And, and we just kept seeing more and more need. And we just wanted to stay. And we didn't really have to get back like we thought we had to because Mr. Philip got a job while we were gone. <laughs> Maybe I... <laughs> Te a temporary job, but he got a job, uh, the one he wanted, yeah. and that was really cool. So, um, but um, and here you see Brian in this store. Um, we picked up a stove. We talked about a stove. I think you, you remember that we wanted to get her a stove, and we were going to bring it down there. And our the the advice we got from Baja Bound was to buy a stove there. Uh, we could get a better price on it, uh, get a discount, and so we ended up buying her a stove. There they are in the. Uh, Hardware store. Hardware store. <laughs> like I girls. said, we had fun. Uh, and, and then we bought a table. We had enough money to go. Uh, we had twice the money we needed. And, and so we, we went across, right across the street from where we bought the stove, which was a really nice hardware store. You can see a family-owned business. Right across the street was a furniture area where there was all kinds of used furniture. So we found a stove and a, and a bench. Uh, we found a table and a bench. And this is Saudi and her mother, Catalina. Uh, and you can see the stove there in the background. It's a smaller stove than we planned on, but it fits really nicely on the table. And there you see uh, they um, prepared. She had some chicken prepared for us with salsa matcha, my favorite salsa. And, um, uh, and then the fresh freshly made tortillas that she made on the new stove. And those tortillas, they were really good. I mean, they were they were warm. You see the bubbles in them? They were warm right there. You could feel the heat coming off the table there in that picture. And um, so they were wonderful. And the thing that Saudi said that struck me was, <coughs> you know, Saudi's very quiet. She's very shy. <coughs> she said, uh, when I cooked those tortillas, I said, do you like the stove, you know, because we kind of had to teach her how to learn it. Well, she stepped right in, and she, w she was less afraid of it than her mother. And she said, I didn't have to suffer because they had been, you know, they'd been cooking over an open fire with wood, and the smoke would get in her eyes. And she was, her eyes, all of their eyes are bloodshot um, from the heat and the pollution in the area. And so she was, and she could cook inside out of the hot sun, and uh, that was really nice. Um, I think that's all I have for right now. I think maybe I could share again at the end, but Brian, you want to share something more? The picture before was a great picture where we were standing in the tire store that we really didn't intend to be at. On Tuesday night, we were going back to our hotel, and all of us were keeping our eyes peeled to find the tire store so that we could maybe price tires or some used tires or new tires to uh, put on her car. And on the way to our hotel, we must have seen, what, Eric, a dozen tire shops on the way there? But it, it was funny, as you're driving along, there's a lot of traffic. All of a sudden, you'd see one, but we're past it already. We can't get over. We can't get off. And after about a half a dozen of that, those experiences, I said, ah, it's just not the right one. We haven't found the right one yet. Sure enough, the next day, as we journey back to the, um, to the house, we're driving through Ensenada, and there's no tire store. And we're like, where'd they all go? We saw 20 of them. And then sure enough, we just before we get into, uh, what's the name of this? Monteadero. We look, ah, there's a tire store. We pull over, we meet this guy, we explain to him what we're doing. He actually knew Baja Bound, and he was familiar with what Baja Bound was doing and was kind of excited about it. He uh, agreed to actually go to um, the house up on the hill and try and help us get the tires off because they were stuck. Um, and through that journey of him helping us uh, with the tires, and we bought tires from him. Oh, here he is at his shop now trying to get these tires off. So that picture that you saw at the very beginning where we were standing there in front of the car um, went from a car that had not run in three years 
flat tires stuck in the mud, unable to get the door open. Um, uh, and no key. And, and no key, that's it. Um, and, uh, if, if, you can, if, you can, if you can think of anything else, you're welcome to contribute and add it in, because that was probably something that was there too. Um, to a car that was running, vehicle and able to move and able to get around with, with newer for them tires on that and it and it just worked and all of those things that came about those were minor things but the net thing is that uh, people that are willing to do and ask us why so are you doing this Derek um, this, this is the remember his name this is, this the, is the tire gentleman this is the gentleman from the tire store I think there was Jaime and one other gentleman that was there anyway, anyway their connection was beautiful they were uh, Christians and really supported what we were doing and even reflected that in the price of services that they come and, and have for us to pay for. It was an amazing experience. Willing to close their shop or to leave their shop to go miles with us that they'd never met before, to go to a place where they'd not been before, to go and to do this on site uh, so that they could help us to get this done. Um, the, the locksmith, to go, he'd never met us before, to go with us in our car, to close down his shop, to go with us, uh, follow us up there to then take off and go into that hot stuff and that thing. And we thought we could set a bite apart. We, we can go beyond this. Um, and he brought up hey all now. the things. And in the midst of that time, to have an opportunity to interact, his wife stayed in the car, to go back and forth with her photographer um, and uh, to bring her a, a, a bottle of water um, while her husband was doing this and that thing. Why are you doing this? Um, and to be able to take care of that privilege for us to be there, and that's why we're here, and feel as best to be there and to help you. I, I think one of the most important parts of the whole weekend, or the whole couple days we were there, was the interactions that uh, Ab or, or Norma got to have uh, with the families and learned more about what they need and, and what their situation is. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the immediately, the, the, the day that we got there, um, Catalina was really happy, but mm -hmm. Julio and the, the, the son was there that had our dog at that time. And I asked Catalina, well, where's Julio? She says, oh, he went to the field to pick green beans with his uncle. And mm -hmm. she said, and it, I'm so glad that you guys are here because she says, it's Julio's birthday today. She said, and he woke up this morning and he slapped himself and he said, well, he goes, it's my birthday today, but I know I'm not going to get anything. Um, and that broke my heart, but then at the same time, I got really excited because Ashley had taken a t-shirt um, that said Adidas on it, and then I had taken a backpack with school supplies. So I told Catalina, I'm like, don't worry about it. I said, when he comes here, he's gonna have something for his birthday. Yeah. So when they arrived, they were happy to see us, and um, we sang happy birthday to him, and um, he opened up his backpack with um, his t-shirt, and he was so happy. And I told him, see, I said, you thought you weren't going to get anything today. I said, but God heard you. So to me, that was very special. Yeah, it was really cool. I was actually like at Costco <laughs> with Jackie Durbin, and I saw this shirt, and I was like, we're going to Mexico. I should get this for Julio. We and the kids and I really connected with Julio and Esperanza. Last time we were there, we played soccer, and he showed us around the house. And as I was getting there, I was like, oh, it's such a small, like, little shirt. It's, like, not a big deal, but I'm excited about it, you know. And then it was so cool to s know that it was his birthday. I felt like it was totally a God thing because, like, Norma and I had no idea that um, it would end up being, like, a little birthday present. So that was really special, and it was good to hang out with him again and, and see how things were going. Amen. Um, I know we're running a little short. John had one more thing. Oh, I, I was just there for the tacos. So he was there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wait, Philip um, did such good <laughs> photography. And <laughs> the whole the beer time. Too. I was the beer guy, by the way, all out myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's called Pliny the Elder. It's a, it's a triple hopped IPA, and it is delicious. <laughs> I he's. I know. I, I did contact Abigail story. first because you know. Just to check if ethically. <laughs> <for> <laughs> I thought she'd be more cool about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh man, Philip, we're glad. We're glad you feel so loved. It um, was a good show. It was a good show. Well.
can I, can I just say that oh, Philip, Philip shot um, tons of footage so and he's putting footage, together yes. a, a video that will hopefully um, be unveiling in the near future. Uh, we know that that takes time and so kind of Philip went to do that and yeah. we're very thankful. But one thought I have and then John, I know you had something else, we'll close. Yeah. Um, isn't God, we, we serve such an amazing God that would, that would send, uh, what I see here, would send six people because some young guy is going to have a birthday, wake up and think he's going to get nothing. And it's like, if that's the, I mean, you, you shared all these other things, which were awesome, getting a car working and a stove where you can make tortillas and a table and all that. But for me, my takeaway was, man, some kid, God knew he was going to wake up and be like, I'm getting nothing for my birthday. So I'll send these six. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll have some Costco. What have you said about Costco being at Costco? That'll happen. And we'll have a backpack and a T-shirt. Uh, so, so, so Julio can wake up and be like, I got a, I got a birthday gift. So don't we serve an amazing God? And we will continue. Um, I know they are, John is committed and, and probably already planning another return trip. So if you want to go down and meet this wonderful family. And that's not it. We got plans for next year as well. And so we'll unveil some of those this fall. But you had one thing you wanted to say real quick? Yeah. And then we'll wrap. Uh, I, I can hardly wait for you to see this film. I haven't seen it yet. This young man, uh, Philip, was working on, on his computer all the way back. And exactly what he was doing, I'm not sure. But he was probably working on that film. Anyway, <coughs> we, I took them all things. over the place. <coughs> I took them all over the place, you know. So he, he went down there, and I don't, or he was watching television. I know at one point, those two were watching some show. I don't know what they were watching. Okay, I'll stop. <coughs> anyway, <coughs> it doesn't matter. No, um, and I could just say, you know, <coughs> each person who went on the trip, there was there was something for them to do, and they played a role, and God had that in mind all along. Yep. Uh, um, you know, I, I, I love to drive. I speak some Spanish. Norma speaks some Spanish. I've been in uh, traveling to Baja off and on, not very much lately, but I started traveling in Baja myself, <coughs> I think, in 1991, and Baja Bound started in 1993. Um, but uh, uh, I, that place has always, and it's grown so much. It's grown so much. Anyway, um, yeah, each person, it, God, God had a plan for them to do what they were doing. And, you know, <coughs> we didn't, we talked to you about the grill, uh, about the stove. We didn't tell you that we were also going to try to fix the car. I think I told Abigail and maybe one or two other people. Because we just, we didn't want it to not work out. And then, but this car is running, you know. A car they haven't had for three years, um, and that they had traded another car for that car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and, and Norma and uh, Ashley being along, we were. I was a little nervous about just going with men there and showing up at her house in her neighborhood, and what would the neighbors say if there here's these three men at her house and the, uh, people talk, you know? And it, so it was great. And and Dr. Stone, man, talk about a prayer warrior. Uh, he yeah. talked to everybody. Mm -hmm. Talk about an extrovert. Uh, wow. He, uh, he gave, he had Sunday school right across the street. There's three little kids that live in that house, and we know that they're not believers. Catalina told us they're not believers, and he had Sunday school right there on the street. Those kids sitting up on the fence, I think he had some bottles of water for them or something. Oh, yeah. Oh, él, él habla mucho del español, se fue a la escuela médico. He went to medical school in Guadalajara. So maybe some of that you didn't, maybe some of you didn't know that. But um, his mm -hmm. fa Spanish was, I think it's more fluent than mine. And, and so um, it was wonderful. Amen. The, the place that everybody fit. And so I think there's a place, there's more people in this room. I, as I get to know you in the table talks, there's people in this room who have the Holy Spirit and they have a talent, some kind of gift that God has given you. And so I just encourage you to come. Um, you will be used uh, and you will be used mightily. Um, there's, there's more. Uh, we, did, we went to a couple and we went to an orphanage, made a delivery, and we went to the Village of Hope. A wonderful ministry there in the area. Uh, these people operate on a shoestring budget and they are... Um, they have a wonderful out, uh, outreach to the local migrant workers. Um, and, yeah, enough, not enough can be said for that. I do have future concerns for this family, so I know, you know there's never, 
there's never going to be a lack of need where, where we can minister that. So Amen. Thank, thank you, thank you for listening, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we thought it was important. We've been, been wanting to share for a few weeks, and we thought it was important to carve out some time, and I think that was well worth it. Amen. And uh, this is why we do what we do, and this is what it looks like to be a part of the local church. And so we're excited about what the future holds and, and what else, like Eric said, is in the room uh, that will come our way. So can we just, I, I know we've gone long, so can we just end in, in prayer and let's just... Uh, let, let this go because sometimes the, uh, the sometimes the message ends and the end of the ministry is like up here in prayer. Uh, but this kind of this kind of message, the ministry is out there. Defend the cause of the needy. Speak up for those who have no voice. The ministry is out there. So let's pray and, and then I'd commission you to be dispersed. Holy Spirit, we thank you that in your wisdom you tell us to use our voice and our talents and our gifts and our money and our energy and our influence and our power and our privilege. And you say, use it to protect those who perhaps don't have it yet, who aren't there. Use it to speak. Use it to defend. Use it to seek justice. And so may we be a local church that do does just that. May we always engage in compassionate ministry. May we always lean toward the poor and the needy. So, God, thank you for what you continue to do through this church. Thank you for the many who give sacrificially and, and so much. Now, send us out this week. Send us out to do just that. Disperse us all over this community into schools and businesses and hospitals and law firms and neighborhoods to speak and defend those who need it most. We go in your name, in everyone's way. Amen. Grace and peace. Peace.